Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode 94. As always, my name is Mark. Here with me today, we've got a bunch of people. We've got Amber. Hi. We've got Orion. Hello. And we have Lindsay. Hello. And we're going to talk about PAX Unplugged, the first convention I've been to since in almost two years. I believe the last convention I did was PAX East 2020. Yeah. Yeah, because you guys went in February, right? That would have been like January? Early, early March. I thought it was okay. I think it was early. I March thought it was weird. Oh, I thought it was a weird date that year, but it yeah. might have been. I it, don't know. It was literally right as everything was shutting down. It was, Some things it was had to been the canceled. Point, it was to the point where I think if it had been scheduled for like two weeks later, they probably would have canceled it. That's like it was like right went, on the edge. So anyway, I went to Comic Con in October. So this is a oh a little yeah. bit uh, on the smaller on the smaller scale, but. <laughs> Yeah, how big? You went to what, Comic-Con New York? Yeah. How big is that? Ooh, they reduced the size significantly this year because of COVID, so it's normally a lot bigger, but there is definitely, I would say, like 10,000 people for for sure, if not more than that, but there's normally quite a lot more. There was actually space to kind of move around the floor this year, and last yeah. last time, I could, I could barely budge. Interesting. I don't think, I bet PAX Unplugged was under that. Definitely. I would say so. In that room that we were in alone, I would say, I don't know if I had to guess. What, 5,000 maybe? I'd say, yeah, a couple thousand. Yeah, that's interesting. I don't remember what the PAX Unplugged numbers. I know PAX East will advertise like sixty to 80,000 turnstiles, which is like, so like 20,000 people a day-ish. But PAX East is also at least twice the size of PAX Unplugged. And PAX Unplugged was cut down. There was a whole quarter of that convention hall space that was not in use where usually it is in use so oh 150,000 people at New York Comic Con just kidding 150,000 people <laughs> across the four days I guess across the four days that's, uh, oh, okay. that's a yeah that's so big. that's hard to, that's crazy but that's hard to 35,000 or something 35 to yeah. 40,000 I'm great at estimating that's massive and that's half the attendance of and that was down that year. yeah I don't know if I'd want to go like PAX East is already too big. <laughs> that's that's incredible. Yeah, PAX Unplugged is a nice size, and it's all board games. So, yeah, there was a lot of room to walk around, and there was a lot of space. It felt for a con- for a convention with a lot of people, it felt like you were really distant and and far away from people where you could be if you wanted to. Yeah, and the the floor seemed seemed like there were a lot fewer booths there, but I didn't really walk the floor very much. But, uh, yeah, it was nice. The expo hall was felt more manageable to me. Like, I did a little bit on Friday, maybe a couple of hours in the expo hall, and I saw everything. Like, I, I at least <laughs> looked at every booth before, you know, the crowds got in the way, and I just wanted to retreat to a table. So, it was yeah, nice. The background roar was significantly less oppressive than it usually is. That's so. awesome. And you were able to find a table, too, no matter what. Yeah. Like, if you, and, if yeah, you wanted you to play a game, there was table yeah. ability. For sure. Even if we had to... <laughs> get a table near the smoke machine and yelling corner where they had some kind of warhammer thing but it was completely blocked by partitions but it, all the, all that you could see was like dry ice smoke coming out of it and then every like 2 minutes there would be like a coordinated scream from the the people inside it was very bizarre it's more like every 20 minutes not too but overall, I had a very fun time. My goal was to play tons of games, and that's what we did. Uh, I did some publisher interviews, which I'm writing about and have written about. Actually, by the time this is published, they will have been written about already. Yes, all three updates um, with what I saw that's c- coming out soon or was recently released. We played a variety of games. Some of them are new. Some of them were a little bit old. One of them is centuries old, or at least a century old, I think. Uh, but which one? Crokinole. Oh, is it really that old? I think it's over a hundred years old. Huh? Maybe. Yeah, I think it is. It's an old Canadian game. Oh. It was invented in Canada. But interestingly enough, our top games. Well, okay, our top two games, at least, I think, are at least three years old. So I don't know. I feel like the board game world peaked in 2017, and nothing so far has 
uh, dissuaded me from that. Well, the pandemic didn't help. <laughs> sure. <laughs> but I don't know. I'm just bad at keeping up with games. So I was trying to catch up, and it turns out that our favorite games were still from 2017 or 18 or whatever. Anyways, we're going to go down the games that we played in some combination together. Some of them were a period of time where it was just me and Amber. Some of them were with all of us, and some of them were with all of us except Amber, I think. Uh, so those are the combinations, and we have ranked them using a pseudoscientific method to go from worst to best. So uh, if you made any of these games, hope they aren't going to be mentioned very soon. Let's start with the first one. The first one is Conspiracy the Solomon Gambit, uh, although I have to put a very large asterisk on this ranking because we did mess up a very critical rule. This one was just me and Lindsay, right? Me, Lindsay, and, and someone who's not here? Mm-hmm, yes. Yeah. So this was kind of a deduction game, kind of a... I don't know how to describe it. You're basically... It was trying to be a lot of different games at the same time, no, but not a... well at any of them. It's an auction game. It's a restoration uh, games game, right? Yes, it's a rest restoration games from an old game. I think that was just called Conspiracy. It's an auction game, but you never know what precisely what anyone's bid is. That's really what it is. And honestly, that might be the theme. A lot of these games are auction games. <laughs> I did a lot of auctioning. Yeah. Uh, so in this game, there's like a briefcase in the middle of the table, and there's some point-to-point -point movement, and there's like six agents, five agents, something like that. And on your turn, you can either move an agent... Or you can spend money to secretly to influence the agents. Because when you move an agent, another person could challenge you on that. And then you do like a back and forth bidding thing where you can't bid more than how much money you have secretly partitioned away for that agent. And if they succeed on the challenge, they stop you from doing anything. So you're kind of finding out information about how much money people have sequestered away for each of the agents as you're playing, but there's some bluffing involved. I can see why they did this game, like why Restoration decided to pick up this game, because it is it does have some interesting ideas. I don't know, Lindsay, what do you think? Yeah, to me, it just I mean, obviously, we we had the one asterisk where we, you know, if you weren't actually... Uh, if you were to challenge a player and you were to lose, it would deactivate you and essentially make your decisions much less powerful, from what I remember. Or you have to like, essentially it just... skip a turn to become... Yeah. We we forgot about the penalty for failing a challenge, is what it was. It just it just felt that, you know, by the time... Because there's so many... There you know, were so many people in, in between you playing, um, that if someone challenged you and you needed to invest in that agent so that you would then be able to challenge them in the future there, that was just basically your whole action rather than actually be able to do anything and the actual dr solomon character which was a side kind of plot that you could or a side action that you could actually do um ben also or uh, ben who also played with us talked about this it just seemed that the function of this one character where they moved down a line basically every time every player went um, and then potentially ended the game that just felt too slow there you know that whole kind of thing that potentially makes the game end it just felt like it needed to go by every player rather than by um, a group of players in order for it to actually be an effective strategy or for it to actually be useful for anything so that just whole part just didn't seem like it was really necessary or doing anything for the game well what it was is a band-aid rule and it's the most egregious, one of the more egregious versions of a Band-Aid rule I have heard, or I've seen, rather, in that the game could essentially reach a stalled state where no one can win the game, so they created this other thing that's a timer. And so at certain points in the game, it'll roll a die to see if the game ends. And, yeah, that it seems very, a very like a very blunt instrument. And yeah. it just wasn't moving quickly enough for it to actually potentially be effective as a timer to me. Yeah. Once we discovered, we thought initially every... that it was going to go down each player, but like even the, the, okay. Turns are very short, 
but it triggers every 14 rounds and then there's only a one in six chance of it triggering the end of the game i think yeah which signals to you that the game's gonna take like 50 rounds which is pretty wild i don't know i would if someone really wanted to i would maybe play again with the correct rules but yeah it didn't impress me no, same. I, I just, yeah, even with the correct rules and seeing how that would affect the game, it just still didn't seem like, it, it just didn't seem like it had enough going for it for me to be interested in it. And I love deception bluffing games. So this is, this is someone who that's their favorite type of game saying that. Yeah. Next on our list is Rise of the Metro. This one Orion and I played, and it is a really cool looking train game, like super, super simple route train game uh, with that honestly as one of the best like visual appeals of any game we played but boy <laughs> it's not very good <laughs> there was just nothing to it beyond that i don't know I mean, how you don't tie th- every like almost every time yeah because each unless we did something unless we really missed something and i read the whole rule book you just on your turn you lay one track that's the only action you ever do And then there's a running point total of the total number of people who are connected to each hub that you're connected to. And you're incentivized to go where other people are because those nodes are worth more points. But then you end up all hitting the same nodes and having the same number of points. So the trackling was a little interesting in terms of not being able to do exactly the same route but or connect the same two nodes directly as someone else. But it just, it wasn't, there was no strategy or there was nothing interesting about the game. It was just, you're just laying down track uh, on a color, colorful track on a city grid and then you all tie. <laughs> yeah. I think, yeah, it, it seemed like a game where once you reach a certain, a certain level of competency, which is pretty easy to reach if you've played route games before, you either tie for the win or you lose because you're further down in player order. And just didn't get access to the overall route that was one better than the next best route. Right. So you could yeah. imagine like a situation in which like you're last in turn order and like your potentially best route is just worse than the other players and you lo- have the tempo loss on them and you just don't win. Yeah. Very disappointing. I wanted that to be good because the, the visuals do look really cool. The map looks awesome. Mm-hmm. If 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 it was like a puke colored map, it would have been like a one out of ten game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, that that's too that's too harsh because I don't know if you've ever rated anything below a two, but there's just nothing there. Yeah, I wish there was, but there just yeah. wasn't. Moving on, this one we all played. Two can the number two, two in the word can, and apparently this is a variation or a copy. I don't know. Of some public domain card game called what's it called? Golf. Called golf. Golf. Uh, not to be confused with the greatest sport history has ever devised. Mm. Uh, you know, there's a card game uh, called the same thing, and apparently it's not very good because Toucan wasn't that good. It was fine, but yeah, there weren't many decisions. I didn't know how to describe this. You've well, got... it's 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 like the game of golf. It's just a game of swapping out cards to see who can get the most points on their tableau. The fewest points. The, yeah, the fewest points. Sorry, the fewest points. And it's just a two by four grid, and you're either trying to match cards, or you're trying to get cards that are as low as possible, from zero to twelve. And there aren't very many decisions, because you're just swapping them out, and sometimes it's really random, and sometimes it's just luck. Um, but for some reason, I remember golf being more fun, and I don't I haven't played it in a while. But Toucan just had the theme as an addition to the golf game. It didn't have a theme. It had a picture of a toucan on a couple of the cards. It was cute. It looked cute. I liked the look of it. I was excited to play it. Yeah, I thought it maybe had potential. Um, I I will say it became much more fun when I was started simultaneously looking for the next game we would play while playing. Mark. (laughs) The big difference seems that I just looked up the rules for golf. The big difference seems to be the actual 
Toucan, which was a, essentially like a wild card, which doesn't seem to be present from my understanding in normal golf that you could Otherwise, place it's out. The same and game. then also essentially, and then, I mean, the point scoring is a little bit different, but a two equals a negative two in golf, whereas in Toucan, um, you know, there's actually negative points for combinations of things. But in golf still, if you have two of the same numbers, it cancels each other out. So there's more you know, incentive to have things cancel out in Toucan because there's, you know, an actual negative point value associated with that. But other than that, it's basically the same game from what I'm reading online. So I just don't think that that's enough of a difference to me to just to justify buying another card game when I could just play the game with the deck of cards that I currently yeah. have. I mean, I don't, major I don't necessarily dislike that because it sucks if you're a designer and you come up with a really cool game that can be played with a deck of cards and now you got to figure out how to make money from it. <laughs> right, yeah. And so you'll see a lot of times you'll see games where clearly they just like added a fifth suit or like a few extra cards in there to make it so you can't really play it with a deck of cards. You would need like a slightly modified deck of cards. I don't I mean, yeah, you could be mad about it, but also you know give one to the designers who need to make money off of their designs. And we, but you could add the Jokers in, and then I think you have two can. I think you, were there only two? you I could. I there were four. There, there are more. But I'm, so if you added the Jokers, so, you, and if your deck came with, like, two add cards. You could essentially make two. You could essentially make yeah. two can. So it's not like we want designers to not make games that, you know, deck of card games, because they're often very fun. So I don't mind that. I do mind that the game was essentially, okay, here's how you can replicate what 2 can feels like. Take a deck of cards, put out, draw like five random cards, and then top deck cards. And if you draw one that matches one of the cards you randomly drew initially, you're happy. And if you don't, you're kind of sad. That's what the game is. Yeah, I don't disagree <laughs> with that. So I will say I still had fun playing it, though, because I love card games. So I still... I think I ranked yeah. it the highest of everybody on the uh, because I just still enjoy playing card games. So there, okay, I was a little unfair. There is some decision making about when you want to trigger the end of the game. That's the most fun part. Yeah, it wasn't not not fun. Like I would play it with kids. I think it'd be a, a cool family game for our families who don't play cards a lot and don't know the rules to all of the various myriad of random card games out there this could be fun but i i normally want more from my card games i agree that the bird theming added a little bit to it for like a children's for a children's game so i think that would that helps make it a little bit more thematic for for kids and they would enjoy that aspect of it i had fun because i was playing it with you guys yeah if, if i was playing with randos it would have been miserable yeah that's fair <laughs> it was like the first game of the day and we're chatty and it didn't actively create a negative experience, but it didn't actively create a positive experience either. Like, the positives we got were that it was a chill game we could chat during. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like just rolling dice and see who can roll the highest number, and you just pass them around until you figure out something else to do. <laughs> yeah, which is what we did. All right, the next one on our list is one Amber and I played, and it is Murano Lightmasters. So I actually liked this game. I didn't dislike this it, game. It was a really, really pretty game, and I really liked that it was pretty and it had real feeling like glass shard pieces. It was, it was cool. The gameplay in it wasn't that interesting to me, and it, it was pretty late at night, so I kept forgetting a couple really simple rules, even though it's a really simple game. But you're basically just making a set of choices and swapping out pieces until you can get a set. And then that set you essentially sell um, for these cards. These cards are these beautiful glass masterpieces um, that you have created with your glass shards. And so there's lots of little moving pieces. There's a dial you get to turn. The mechanics were cool. But I guess like Toucan, I kind of wanted more from it. I don't know. I was expecting it to be not heavier, but just have some more interesting choices with the little pieces. Yeah, it didn't do enough to differentiate good and bad play. Like, sure, yeah, yeah the person who played the best is going to win the game, but they're going to barely win the game, I think. So it didn't do enough to, like, reward a really good move. 
Mm -hmm. Um, But it did look cool. It does incorporate the box as part of what you play with because you open the box and there's this bowl with these little uh, plastic, clear plastic, like Mancala like pieces, uh, which represent your glass shards. The the theme was what glass blowing, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's a contract Mm -hmm. fulfillment game. So you get these hand of cards. You have to fulfill the contracts, which require certain glass pieces. And you're just trying to figure out the most efficient way to uh, to acquire the colors that you need without acquiring too many. Because if you get excess pieces, you're penalized. Or you could, like, lock yourself out. Like, not not actually lock yourself out. But lock yourself out to a degree where you lose, like, a tempo. Um, so there were some interesting puzzly aspects to it. I just, I've seen better... If you want, like, a better contract fulfillment game that has a similar really cool look, I would go for Noctiluca, which we played, either, I think, at, I think maybe at that last PAX East we attended, or maybe the one before that. It, it was at a PAX East. Uh, but it also has a similar visual appeal, but I thought the decisions were more interesting there, and also a contract fulfillment game. Uh, so it was fine. It was, it was neither good nor bad. Um, it was an acceptable game. Yeah, I, w- I wouldn't be surprised if there's a couple people out there who really, really like it. But I don't think for most people, I don't think anyone's going to get particularly excited about it. Yeah, well, the best thing about it was the look of it, the look and the feel. Mm-hmm. So if you're into that and that's important, this would be a pretty good game. Yeah, it's um, fine. But I think that overshadowed the gameplay a little bit. That's all. Yeah. Another one we tried out that also has a unique visual appeal Mm -hmm. is Micro Macro Crime City, which I should look this up. I think won the spiel or at least was nominated. Cool. Um, Was this just you and me or did anyone else play it? This was just you and I. Yeah. So this one, you get this giant map that's full of... Of the super, super detailed line drawings. It's very large. <laughs> like how it's it's got to be at least, it's got to be what, three feet by four feet maybe? That sounds about right. Yeah, it would not fit on a card table. It did win the spiel. It won the spiel to TRS. Oh, okay. And I can see why. It's definitely unique. It's definitely something that I don't think we've seen before. It's basically Where's Waldo, the board game. I really liked this one, and I know I think I liked it a lot more than you did. <laughs> I think I would have liked it in a different lighting situation. <laughs> the really like harsh, flat convention lights, true, where you're like trying to squint over this, like lean over the table, like climb on the table and squint at little tiny details. You got to really prep your lighting situation to make this not a headache-inducing situation. But yeah, you're given, we went through, what, three different scenarios in maybe 45 minutes? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was really easy to get through quickly. There were things that we caught and things we didn't. So we did yeah. win each scenario. We we figured out what was happening, but we didn't catch all the little tiny details in all the scenarios, which I thought was cool. Yeah. There's a lot to unpack and explore. I do think this game would be better hanging on a wall rather than on a table. That would actually be a really good idea. Yeah, if you posted it on a wall, mm-hmm. and especially, like, we played, all those scenarios we played, like, the first three were ranked as, like, super easy, uh, and, and I'm curious how good the hard scenarios are, because I bet they're more detailed, mm-hmm. but I get they, I, or I bet they rely much more on deduction and inference than the ones we had, which... Mm-hmm. had like one instance where you had to like actually figure something out and not just find something on the map. Right. And we missed it because we were used to finding things on yeah. the map. Yeah, <laughs> so it was like introducing us to that concept, I mm-hmm. think. So I could see this going up in my rankings uh, if I played more, and I can totally see why people really liked it and why it won the spiel because it is super unique. Uh, part of what makes it interesting is that the the image on the map isn't necessarily static in time. so. There were, I think, in every all three of the scenarios we were in, we were charted with following someone on the map. So there, it would actually show their path walking, of like multiple instances of them throughout their journey. Uh, so you're not necessarily it, it's it's amorphous in terms of the time that it's capturing. So things aren't necessarily simultaneous if they're drawn on the map. But there's so much detail that that doesn't actually throw you out of it, which mm-hmm. I thought was cool. Um, it's an interesting game. It, it, yeah. 
I wouldn't be opposed to trying it again. Yeah. For sure. But yeah, maybe hung on the wall and then maybe orient some lights so it doesn't hurt your face Yeah, to play. Well, I don't really see how this game would work in a lot of people's houses because <laughs> it requires a very large table and then it's just this white paper essentially that's on the table and prone to damage and spills we even saw some damage at the convention tables so that's no, why i think the wall the wall not, is better yeah I don't know. yeah it's interesting next is one that amber didn't play but me Lindsay, and orion did and that's the estates which Orion and I liked quite a bit, and Lindsay hated with the vengeance of a thousand suns. This was a fascinating game. Anytime you play a game that you can win by having the least negative points is going to be interesting. Yep. In fact, I bet the more you play it, like the more you get knowledge of the game, I think there's a less and less likelihood of anyone ever scoring positive points. That's my suspicion. You think yeah, you I think the points play. are only just going to get more negative as people become more experienced in the game. I would agree with that. I think so. In our game, I was the only one to have any positive points. And I bet, yeah, with more experience. I can't imagine, like, experienced players ever filling, ever actually accomplishing a row or a column. Like, there's so much of an incentive for someone to screw up that column. And you only secured your points on the very last move of the game yeah you had the most money at the end so you're able to win the final bid and secure points yeah it, it's a very cool game though so i'll discuss why i liked it and then Lindsay can explain why she didn't and i could totally see you know i i think extreme reactions to this game are probably normal because it is so mean so it's a sort of shared incentives game yeah, it's definitely a shared incentives game. Also an auction Maybe game. Maybe a shared disincentives game. There's both. There's there's lots of... You're always in bed with someone at some point, and maybe multiple people to varying degrees. So you're auctioning primarily off these blocks, and you're building towers with these blocks arranged in these rows. I don't even know where to go next in the description. Uh... <laughs> So Basically, ideally okay, what so you're trying to do is finish a row by building a tower of some size on each of the spaces in that row up to four to start with and then putting a roof on them. And when you put a roof on the building, it will theoretically score points for the person who owns the company color that is at the top of that building. You acquire the company ownership by winning the bid for the first block of that color in the game. So you, there's already like this asynergistic thing where you want to get blocks. If you want to own companies, you got to bid for blocks to put them at the bottom of towers. But to actually score from those companies, you need that company's colored block on the top of towers. The other point is that each of the house blocks, or I think they're called floor blocks, they have a number on them and you have to put a smaller number when you're as you're building your skyscraper or house you know multi-level house you have to put a smaller a lower number than whatever was showing to continue stacking and so one of the things i was looking at is when we had the initial grid of all the we could see all the numbers that were going to be auctioned off at some point and i looked at the different colors and tried to rank which one I thought was the best based on how many low numbers it had, because those are easier to cap off a building with. But it didn't work out that way for me in that game. Yeah. Most critically, perhaps, you can also put up for auction these three barrier tokens of one, two, or three Building strength. permits, I think. Yeah, yeah, permits. That either, that whoever wins the bid for any one of them can choose to either increase or decrease the length requirement of that row by the number on the permit so by one two or three so what happened was what was it orion and ben went real hard or i guess all three of you went hard on this one row and the nice the middle of the game was me just saving up money and then bidding for all the permits to extend that row super far so they could never complete it 
Because then what happens at the end of the game, which is triggered one of a couple ways, if all the points that are scored in a row that is not completed are negative, and it's possible to have all three of the rows be negative. In our game, one of them was positive, and I happen to have the most the most points there. That's why I won the game. All right, Lindsay, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so my um my points as well as my review in this one are you know going to be neg we're, we're we're negative, but I do have to preface that I'm going into it because I don't love open bidding games that much, so I'm always going to kind of go in with that mindset to these kind of games. But I I think the reason I didn't like it because is because the only the winning strategy here seems to own no own no companies and just hide money and then just bury every other player. And so as long as you're the only player to do that, then you're just going to win. I so think that's I just necessarily can't necessarily a dominant strategy. I think but that the, just seems like the end result like of the game is work. so is so player controlled that you can adjust to anyone running away from it if as long as you have enough foresight, which is probably the skill that that's... you need to, to figure out as, or you you cultivate as you're playing the game. I don't think there's necessarily a dominant strategy. I think yeah. I mean, no if you're the only person that a good does that, yeah, I can I can see that. But I just think that that if you do that and none of the other players do that, then I don't know how you would not win in that situation because you, all of your efforts would just be on sabotaging other players. And but if you're stashing that much you know, money, you also have less purchasing power in order in order to do that to, to negatively influence it. Yeah, no, that's definitely true. And so there is a disadvantage to that. But I think. I think in general, too, maybe I'm just too nice of a person, but I, I think I just don't like how what I guess all games, technically speaking, are going are you're technically trying to sabotage the all of the other players by winning and by having the winning strategy. But I think with this one, it's maybe just a little too intent on your whole go- game is to sabotage everyone else and be mean to other players. And I think maybe I don't gravitate towards that style of game and more towards a game where I'm responsible for my own success and I'm making all of my own moves and actions to influence my score rather than sabotaging everyone else to influence my score. Um, So maybe I'm just too nice of a person. There you go. I think Amber would probably like this game. I don't know. I like, I also think Amber would like this game. I like mean games, but I don't know. I would I would play it. I would play it and see. This is definitely one of the meanest games I've ever played. So one of the interesting parts of this game for me was maybe halfway through, I had a my mindset shifted and realized I couldn't win by scoring points. I could only win by everyone else losing worse. Because the only spot I had points was in that first row where I had put the mayor earlier on when I was, which doubles all the points, either positive or negative for the row. Earlier on, when I had buildings in that row, I placed the mayor because I thought, well, great, I'll just, you know, slam down everything in this row and um, figure it out later. But then both Ben and Lindsay were scoring more points in that row than I was. And Mark was in the other rows. And well, so the moment you put down the mayor was the moment I realized I had to dedicate all of my efforts to making sure that row never scored. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But also I realized if that row scored, I would lose. So right. I had to shift to be, okay, I don't want this row to score, but I also need all the other rows to not score because I have the least liability out there. But I have, there's no chance for me to end up with more positive points than someone else. Mm -hmm. And so the rest of the game, I mean, I think I discarded more tokens than anyone else just trying to end the game and, you know, not finish things, which was, I don't know, it, it felt weird to play that way. But yeah, I think it's a cool game. It's very mean. Uh, if you don't like, games where you're trying to end up the least screwed then you probably won't like this game but i think the shared incentives and figuring out the right how to bid and what to bid on things is really interesting yeah and in that sense it shares a lot of dna with train type games or even like area control games where it's often you you have to really, really pay attention to the position everyone else is in relative to you rather than just trying to accomplish something. It's it's much more zero sum. 
Yeah. It's also a closed economy, which yes. adds to that. A closed some... economy in which people, in which players can, once per turn, once per round, on their turn, remove yeah. some money from the game and stash it as points. Yeah, it, it, ca- it was called like a legal stash money or bribes or I don't know something. But yeah, the state. It's it also looks cool. I like the visual look of this one uh, from Capstone. I don't know if I'll get myself a copy of this, but it's definitely one I I want to play more. Moving on, we've got Dinosaur World, which Amber and I played, which is the semi-sequel to Dinosaur Island from Pandasaurus. I think that's the name of the first one. I think Dinosaur World... Actually, I don't remember if it was advertised as being more or less complex than Dinosaur Island. I never played the first one. It was pretty complex. It was pretty complex. I got a shout out to the random person we played with. Mm-hmm. I don't remember his name. I'm sorry. Who after the game <laughs> in which I had a pretty tough go- time like wrapping my head around the cadence of the game. It was like the last game we played. It was like at 11 we were o'clock. We really tired. I was really tired. <laughs> uh, but anyways, I'm coming out of this game thinking, wow, that was a good like medium to heavy game. You know, that's. That really put my brain for a loop. The guy says, yeah, that's definitely way lighter than my usual games, but oh, I liked yeah. it. He was funny. And I'm like, whoa, you must play some heavy games. He's like, yeah, I like Lacerda games and all that. And I don't think this is, I don't think Dinosaur World is less complex than like the Gallerist. Well, <laughs> I mean, I think we were all tired and we all had the same kind of approach to the game where we were just having fun with it. None of us was playing it super competitively intent on winning. That helped a lot. The, the theme also helped a lot. We we wanted to grow our little dinosaurs with excitement being generated. I don't know. I think it was a particular a particular group at a particular time that resulted in us all having a chill in attitude. Me thinking that the game was more complex than it was? That's possible. Yeah, you thinking it was more complex. Do you think that game was far less complex? Have you played the Gallerist? I think I played it with you once. I didn't really enjoy it. Okay. I think it was on par with the Gallerist. I don't know. Maybe slightly less. I don't know what that guy was talking about. But it might have just been that I was sleepy. It was, just... It's one of those games where you have to plan out your entire, like the entire round from the start. Yeah. Because you draft these cards with these little with these little meeples on them that are like your workers or your currency. And so you have to allocate them throughout the entire, like all six or eight phases of the round. And so you can't like just think about what you're doing in the first phase because you got to save up meeples for your last phase, you know, and everything in between. So you have to plan out the entire thing all at once, which is a lot to keep track of. It was um, a lot to keep track of. So there's just a lot to to organize like throughout time. And so it, was, it it has that age of steam thing where if you screw up in your calculation at the very beginning of your round, you just completely hosed yourself for the entire round and then you're behind. And I don't know how much I like those kinds of games rather than games that are a bit more tactical. Yeah, it had a lot of... It's not that it wasn't tactical, it's that the actual tactic you're planning is very long. It had a lot of calculations without placeholders. So it was hard to visualize things and keep track of things. And that's not the kind of game that's good for playing at 11, 11 o'clock, o'clock at night. night. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> um, so it was all right. But it was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed playing it. Yes, I made... I I. You killed a bunch of people. <laughs> I made lots of raptors, and they ate lots of my park guests, and that caused okay. me to go down to like well, from like fifty eight points to eight the at the f- end of the game. The first building that Mark built was a raptor cafe with a live raptor in it, where guests could watch the raptor as they ate. Unsurprisingly, that raptor killed guests every single round. <laughs> yes. My park was very exciting, though. <laughs> it had the most excitement of any park. It did. And the most deaths by far. Yeah. It's, it has one of those mechanisms where you... It's the same mechanism as 
London, Martin Wallace's London, where in London you're creating what is it debt? No, not debt. You're creating what? Do you remember what the the poverty cubes? Poverty, yeah, poverty cubes. That's right. <laughs> in this one, you create like death, like or danger. I don't know what they're called. They're like red tokens. Those are actual deaths, Mark. They're actual deaths. Yes. Okay, mm-hmm. well, something like thirty. The people real died meeples in died in the production of this game. <laughs> like thirty people got killed. Uh, but second place, would you have the least number or was I it had, our friend? I had the least number of deaths. With like three? But we were close. With like three. So I had like 20 something more deaths than the last place person. And that went like double the size of the little handy chart <laughs> that they give you. <laughs> so I lost almost all of my points. Mm-hmm. I believe, actually, I'm going to look up the score real quick. We We were all shocked that it was not a negative score. I was. Would you say that you got t-wrecked by this game well i just thought it was so appropriate because you know you have this exciting park and then all these people die and for a while it's okay because you're still making money but then you get hit with all the wrongful death lawsuits and i thought maybe i would be able to get far enough ahead because i at the end of the game before we calculated this adjustment i was winning but i wasn't winning by that much I needed to like double the score of everyone else. Yeah, the final score was our random friend got 52, Amber got 49, and I had eight. For accounting for all the murders, I had like 60. So <laughs> there. Does this game uh, Tricera top the other dinosaur game that we that we played relatively that one, recently? That one wasn't good, Lindsay. <laughs> <laughs> but like actual question though. Wait, what dinosaur game? The card dinosaur game that we played the other day. Oh, Dinosauria. This is better than Dinosauria. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think this game... Maybe. I don't know. It might rub me the wrong way. No. I think there's some fun stuff here. It, it, was, it was a bad context. It would also become a lot less complex on the second playthrough. That's the thing. It's one of those like yeah. really like intense rules overhead, but all the rules make sense, so yeah. they're going to be easy to remember the second time through. Yeah. And... It's also kind of visually busy. Yeah. The little pieces will also make more sense. I will say in this game, all of us seemed to kind of pursue the same kinds of strategies. And there was a whole part of the game focused on goals that we never even really got to. Like our oh, random- I was going to. I think we were all going towards some of the goals and then we kind of oh. abandoned them. Yeah, we all abandoned them. <laughs> I was I was one resource short of achieving the the mo- the highest scoring goal. I wasn't even close to any I of mean, them. I mean, it wouldn't have made me win the game. It, it was it was like 8 points, but Yeah. Interesting. I, I was that's cuz I spent remember I spent like 5 minutes trying to calculate my final turn. Yes, I do remember. I, I felt so bad. My brain just <laughs> shut off and I I it was one of those things where no matter which way I allocated things i was still one resource short and so i had to just concede that i was one resource short um i felt bad. that always that. feels bad you yeah. keep looking at it and you're like surely there's a way it's to make like, this work but it's no. like one of those mage knight turns where you're like i think i can accomplish this thing and you're like no i'm one point short <laughs> it was like that yeah. i would play this again for sure when i'm more awake all right next on our list is the game that I saw multiple people say was the best game, of, best new game of PAX Unplugged, so Game of the Con. And this was the game that I had most hyped, the new game that it was most hyped to me going into PAX, so it was like number one on my list. And maybe I would have liked it a little bit better if it wasn't hyped so much, because it was a good game. But I don't know what people are necessarily seeing in it. Anyways, this game is Furnace, which Amber did not play. Nope. Yeah. I don't know how much you would have liked it. Uh, And this is another auction game uh, in a very, very kind of simple resource conversion game where there's three basic resources and you're getting them and converting them between each other in order to cash them in for points. But the auction system is really what the game is about. So you get this row of cards. The whole game is pretty much cards. And everyone has a one, two, three, and four power bidding block. and to bid on a card, you put down one of the blocks. Four is the most powerful. You can't tie, so it has to be a different number than what else is on has been bid before. But if you lose the bid, you... You get compensation, which comes in the form of resources which are printed on the card. So instead of getting the card, which is an engine that you put in your tableau, you get some number of resources or a single-use uh, conversion. 
yeah, so the game is often about not winning bids strategically, which I think is the best, like the coolest part of the game, is that you're trying to strategize which bids you don't win so that you can get the immediate resources. Because like not winning a bid is almost, if not sometimes more powerful than winning the bid because you're getting the resources immediately instead of over time if you claim the card and then pump it every turn. For and in rounds. potentially multi- multiples. You know, if you put a three down and it's not winning, then you're able to get multiples of that conversion or that resource. So making sure that you know, you're know you maximizing your compensation without actually winning. Yeah, I agree. I think that was such an interesting concept about this game. And I really, I really liked that aspect of the game. Yeah, and I had a special power where my losing bids were more powerful. So I, over four rounds, I think I only acquired five cards, maybe six. Whereas Ben acquired tons of cards. He must have gotten ten or more. His power was that he had an extra two token. Oh, right. Mine was that I could double, I, I was I was never blocked on bidding. I could put the down the same number or color, which normally you can't. And Lindsay. Mine I didn't. Mine I didn't to... like that much, but I also could have been not optimizing it. But it was that I could spend two resources to run a card again. So oh, okay. you know, I had to have the two resources oh. to be able to run to run a card again. It was interesting, but I think um, I think not my favorite of the powers on the table. Yeah, what I did was I completely didn't use one of the resources. The oil. Yeah, the I oil also oil did not use the oh, oil. Really? I believe interesting Mm -hmm. because that was the tier two resource because you had coal and steel that you could just generate flat and coal was more plentiful and then oil always came via a conversion i think or almost always and then you were trying to turn those resources in various combinations into money with victory points was the money used in any other way other than for points I don't think so. I think it was literally just points, but they were money tokens, which is kind of weird. But yeah, I expected more complexity from the game. Like, the actual resources and resource conversion part of it is just about as simple as you can possibly get. It was a pared-down version of London, I think. But instead of taking cards from an offering, you uh, were bidding on an offering each round. Yeah. I I liked the bidding aspect of of the game and i i think that i agree that trying to to lose the best in a, in a bidding war is an interesting concept that i don't think i've seen that much in games so i really like that aspect of it a lot it gave me a lot of sidereal confluence vibes but i actually was kind of hoping that there was some tr- there was some trading possibilities which obviously was not a part of the game um but i think the one thing kind of holding me back a little bit is you you gain these cards and then you can only use them once and you have to do everything in order so is the is the tracking ability of actually tracking your engine and how it's running? I think that that wasn't always the easiest thing to be able to to do once you have it up and running. But other than that, I actually really enjoyed this game and I would definitely play it again. Yeah, there actually was a variant in the rulebook where you could not, where you establish every time you get cards, you establish an order for your engine and you couldn't alter the order, which maybe would be more interesting. I don't know. That would be kind very of, interesting, actually. I don't know if that's more interesting or if that's just adding more complexity without any gain in fun. I'm not I sure. think that would add. A, I think that would add a lot of fun because it would it would really add a whole other level of thinking to when you're adding a card to it to a game. I think. Yeah, maybe it's one you of can't those just variants your cards. that's like really the real game, and you just have to realize you know they cut out the variant. It's like Magnate, the first city, where the and I still think he should. He shouldn't label it as a variant, but the thing that's labeled as a variant is actually the real game, and you're missing out on a whole lot if you don't play with it. But yeah, I think, yeah, Furnace, I'm I'm only hesitant, like, Furnace is a fun game. I'm only hesitant on it because it was hyped so much, and I don't know what people are seeing in it. It does, it also seems like almost like the prototypical resource conversion to where, like, all resource conversion games could be described in terms of furnace. It's like the fodder for high concept pitches for resource. Like Sidereal Confluence is just furnace with trading. Zulkin is just furnace with wheels. <laughs> it's like the base unit of a resource conversion yeah. game. <laughs> like how like Splendor is like the base unit for engine building. Yeah. <laughs> 
It reminds it, in that sense it kind of reminds <laughs> me of Splendor. It's not as simple as Splendor, but yeah, I was expecting more. I don't know. It could also be one of those games that like when the first expansion comes out, like it just blows the game wide open and it becomes great. I could totally see yeah. that too. I thought it was interesting each round one of the decisions you're making is which card you definitely want to add to your engine because if you put a four on something you're guaranteed to get the card and so trying to figure out that and then what compensation you wanted and then what order in which to bid to make sure you got the compensation you wanted um, that whole process was interesting and then running your engine was kind of a little mini game basically Mm -hmm. I guess my description of, like, I think Furnace is, my my play of it was good, not great. And my description is that it was full of a lot of interesting decisions, but no exciting decisions. Like, it was just, it was just, like, steady. It was a steady, solid game. I think making the decision on how to lose was very, it was very interesting to me. I enjoyed thinking about that and playing off of other people's actions in regards to that. So yeah, this is, I mean, this is definitely a game I want to play again because of that, how the bidding works specifically in this game. So I'm I'm hoping in more plays, like there's some depths that are revealed. I think you need something a little more to give it staying power. I I agree. Yeah. And I'm not sure what that looks like, either more, more interconnection of the cards or a way to like combine cards or something or like, or a trading system. I don't know. Yeah, or or like one more resource with more interesting com like more interesting interactions with the resource or cards that give you like abilities beyond like converting two for one of a particular resource like just more variation. I was waiting for like the fun cards to come out, like the you know how like in games that have will have like tiered decks. So like phase one of the game is deck one, and then deck two, and then deck three, and deck three is all wild and crazy. This is like a game that was all deck one. Yeah, I think that would be an interesting addition if you like you said, if there was an expansion with kind of different levels of cards that come out, I think that would actually add a lot to the game and, and add to its replayability for sure. If you wanted to play yeah. it more than a few times. Or like w- with Brass, how you hit the second phase and you reset the map and you're building a different you're building trains instead of canals. Yeah, right? some kind of hard reset or like hard like focus shift would be interesting. Like swapping out one resource just... for another, so you have you can invest in the the age one resource, and then it that all becomes obsolete or something. I don't know. Or like something. Or you could just play Brass numbers. instead, oh, that's because true. Brass is such a good game. Brass is just a better game. So. <laughs> brass is just such a good game. Yeah, well, you, you can just say, play Brass. Brass every is day. better than every game we played at PAX. <laughs> brass is maybe yeah. my number two of yeah. all time for yeah. sure. Uh, ten out of ten Gloom Havens. I think. No, well, it has to be nine point nine 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 Gloom ha- Gloomhavens because Gloomhaven okay. is is the ultimate top tier. But isn't anyway. Gloomhaven just one Gloomhaven? That is that is technically true. So well, I I, yeah, I mean, I rate every game. It's ten over ten. Yeah, and therefore it is one. ten over ten Gloomhaven. Yeah. So it is a whole one, and then everything else is a fraction of a Gloomhaven. There we go. Okay, the singular group. I didn't ruin your rating system. I thought I had. Actually, something interesting in Furnace is if there was like. I wonder if you could do like a fifth phase or maybe even introduce, maybe add like a fifth round and then introduce something in like the th- beginning of the third round where all of a sudden money becomes also a resource and like everything, like there's like just a ramp up point to where now like the money you've generated can become important for getting more points later on. I don't know. Like you could spend money to use a card multiple times or something. It would have to be something significant. Yeah, I don't know. Mm. I feel like the game wants something like that. All right, next is the only game that I have played before, but I wanted to mention it because it's super fun. Crokinole. Amber, tell us about Crokinole. So it was the first time I played Crokinole. I thought we played a couple packs ago. Nope. Oh. I've never played with you or anyone. Um, You told me about it a few packs ago. But this is basically a game where you flick little circles back and forth on a very smooth, polished wooden board, and there are some obstacles in the middle, and you go back and forth, and there are some rules with when you have to hit the other player's pieces, um, or where you can flick the little wooden circle. 
but it's really, really, really simple. Um, and it's pretty much a dexterity game. Like you have to actually physically manipulate the pieces. Yes. Yeah. It's kind of like circular shuffleboard with obstacles. It's got yeah. a little bit of shuffleboard. Yeah. It's got a little bit of billiards. Yeah. Or pool. But it's like pool because you have to touch certain discs first yeah. in some situations. Uh, so it's kind of like nine ball in that respect. Yeah. Mark definitely won. I don't think... I did not win a single game that we played. It was close, though. I won some rounds, and there were some close moments, but Mark is definitely much better at this game yeah. than me. It's a very beautiful board. I like the look of yeah. it. Yeah. Someday I want to get a crokinole board and have a little table. We do a little stand-up crokinole table in the corner. We're going to need a lot more room in the house, though. It no, is a very large board. We could board. put it back in that corner over there. Yeah, but then I'd take up the whole table. <laughs> well, it wouldn't. The little table back there? Yeah, it would. No, 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 we get a little circular stand-up table, and then it it does it's a table that's not even as wide as the board. Maybe. Someday. Someday. <laughs> I think it's very fun. It, it was very, very fun, and very popular. They had lots of these tables set up with the game at PAX, and I guess you could buy the boards? Yeah, this is like, the I think, the third... Between PAX East and PAX Unplugged, plugs... I think it's the third one I've seen where this company has done that. They bring like 30 boards. They set them up, but you can purchase the boards that people are playing on and you just take it at the end of the convention. Mm -hmm. It wasn't too hard to get a table, but most of them were full at any given time. People really liked it. The first packs that this company did this, the tables were constantly full all the time. It was really hard to find one. Yeah, there were one or two tables open, but this packs was smaller, so that helped. Yeah. We yeah. played it a few times. It was I fun. think it is charming. It is a charming game. Yes. It looks cool and it's like a it's like a little it's like a it's like a coffee table book of board games because if you had one set up in your house, people would be like, "Ooh, what's that?" But instead mm-hmm. of being a boring book, it would actually be a game you can play with them. Yeah. It's a talking <laughs> what is a what do you what do you call something like that? A talking point? Mm-hmm. Maybe. A, conversa- <laughs> a conversation piece. That's what it is. <laughs> yeah. In game form. Anyways. Yeah, I really wanted to play this, but didn't get a chance to. But I love this kind of stuff. So. Yeah. Yeah. I'm jealous. It's good. It's, it's a very different kind of game. So it was a good break from the rest of the con. Yeah. Fucking games are good. Next is Salvage. And this was the last game we played at PAX Unplugged. And we ended on a good note for sure. This is a variation on hearts, but a very interesting variation on hearts. I forget, what's the deck like? Is it four suits still, or was it three? It was, I think I think it was 36 cards in total, so I want to say it was three suits, if I'm just remembering off of the... But the numbers only went up off to of like the seven. Or no, it was only one to nine. It was one to nine, so it was four, four suits, but one to nine. So four suits with a smaller deck. No trump, though. No trump. Like hearts, right? Hearts doesn't have a... Oh, no. Spades are trump in hearts. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, no, there's no there's no, there's no there's trump, trump in no, hearts. There's no trump. trump. It's been a long time yeah. since I've played hearts. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no trump like hearts. There is one suit, though, like hearts. All the, all the cards are worth a point. They're, instead of one card that's worth 13 points, there are two other cards that are worth three points apiece. So the in separate suits, the, the special card is split up and a little bit less important. But the crazy part is that before you even do the trick taking thing, there's a bidding phase where you're bidding for these tokens and the tokens are actually point mitigation for the trick taking phase. So if you have four tokens and you take five points in the game, you would instead have one point and you're trying to have the lowest score. But the crazy thing is. <laughs> So on your turn on the bidding thing, you can take as many tokens as you want. However, if someone takes the last token, the whole thing goes bust. You all, everyone loses points because, well, okay. You start at 20 points and you're trying not to lose points. So everyone loses points equal to the number of tokens they've taken. Everyone passes their hand of cards to the left, their whole hand, and then you do the bidding thing again. (laughs) Well, 
And then and the person with the lowest score determines how many cards get passed as well. Yeah, there's, there's also zero a passing like in hearts. In, but instead of passing two mm-hmm. cards, yeah, whoever's losing the game chooses how many cards between zero and two. And so you could always have someone just blow up the entire thing and accelerate the end of the game. Because once someone hits zero points, that triggers the end of the game. But if you go all the way around blowing up this auction thing to where you get your original hand of cards back. The game is over. You do one more trick-taking phase. If you get... uh, If you don't score any points, basically, given the tokens, you get a point back. Like, one point back. Otherwise, you get no points, and the game's just over. So, theoretically, you could have an entire game of salvage where you do one round of trick-taking, and whoever does the best in that wins. Now the incentives. I feel, like, I feel like that would never happen though, because everyone has to pass on every hand of cards. Yes. So, for that to happen, someone has to make one to two people make a conscious on choice. A terrible sure. mistake on valuating their hand. Because Multiple clearly, people. Yeah. Clearly, in any given trick-taking situation, one hand is going to be the best hand, and so someone has to not recognize that they have the best hand because the. The whole bidding thing ends when two people pass in a row. So So the same person can't really theoretically tank every single time. And they can, but it would be difficult because two people are able to pass and you don't need all three to do so. So there's this whole like pre-trick taking thing where you evaluate your hand and calculate whether or not it's worth effectively usually losing one to three points compared to everyone else in order to not play that round with the hand you currently have, which is really, really fascinating. Because if you're going to take the last piece, you're probably going to lose points compared to someone else, unless you're going to gain compared to someone else, in which case it's even tastier of a decision to to blow it up. There's a shooting the moon mechanism. It's not as powerful as in hearts. It's three points uh, to the other players. You can shoot the moon. It's just a really interesting variation on hearts, where there's like yeah, just a game that we all we all played during college during the class that we could you know that basically they just presented PowerPoint slides. The game that we were all playing when that happened. Um, It just adds like another level of complexity to something that we already know and love. So Mm -hmm. I enjoyed making a game out of a game that I already love in a way that maybe Toucan didn't quite do, um, and adding a level of complexity. Yeah. So I managed to salvage the game of hearts for me um, from my repertoire. That's true, because we've been playing a lot of spades the last couple of years as our trick-taking games. Oh, and I love spades. Spades and pirate yeah. tricks are trick-taking games of choice. And yeah, spades is definitely better than hearts, but... Or the crew, or the crew. Or the crew, yeah, the crew. I, that's its own thing. I mean, it is trick-taking, but it's its own thing. But yeah, it's almost like a soft bidding mechanism. Like, it's not as severe as spades, but it takes hearts and gives it a soft bid which is really really interesting so this is uh this is a really cool game small box game i have no clue if it's available it was in the first look section it is a 2021 release don't know if it's in print maybe i should look that up and see if i can buy a copy next on the list i have no clue if i'm pronouncing this correctly but i'm just going to try i'm going to say it is pronounced nidavalier close enough or that's outside. what I would say. I think, yeah. I bet you're wrong. That's, if it wasn't <laughs> Viking themed, I could perhaps pronounce it a romantic way and say it's need of a year. I don't think it's that because it's a Viking theme. <laughs> I don't think it comes from a romantic language source. Yeah, no, I think it's a hard L, not a not yeah, the Y. So. No. Although is is the double L that's that might be Spanish specific. I don't know if that was in Latin. That's a Spanish thing. That's Spanish. Yeah, specific, Spanish. Yeah. Mm-hmm. In Portuguese, maybe? maybe? Maybe not. I don't know. I never learned Portuguese. Yeah, so Nidavlir, another auction game. Would you look at that? And this one is Vikings, or Dwarf Vikings? Kind of, or Viking-y dwarves? I don't know. It's kind was of it fantasy. Vikings? It was just dwarves. They held lots. I guess it's just dwarves, but I mean, I dwarves are dwarves. always co- coded kind of Nordic. Yeah, so fantasy dwarves? Yeah. This is, yeah, another auction game you're auctioning for cards, and it's got a 
variety of different set collection mechanisms. It's got to set collection what like modern art is to auctions in that it just gives you all the different types of set collection. So there's like two different like exponential curves for yeah. two different sets. There's one that's what multiplicative. So you multiply the number by the 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 power by the number of units. There's mm-hmm. one that's just points. There's one that's just points, but it has another thing attached to it. If you have the most of it, you get to double something else. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, there's points all over the place. The scores are super high. They're in the hundreds. But the coolest thing is that, well, there's a couple cool things. The bidding phase is interesting because you also have the capability to upgrade your coin tokens that count as your bids. But to do that, you have to bid a zero on something. Uh, so you probably get last pick there. Um, but you do definitely want to upgrade your coins, I assume. I don't know what a zero upgrade Your coins are also like. victory points. They're also the points. You, you want to upgrade them. And then also, it has like the generic tension between specialization and uh, going broad in that once if you get a set of each of the colors, you get a bonus special card to choose from. So a super powerful card. Yeah, which is quite powerful. So it's got a lot of stuff that you see in lots of games, but it's implemented very well. Um, The bidding's Mm -hmm. interesting. What you want to go for is interesting. At certain points, because the a lot of them are exponential, you want to start blocking people uh, from certain things. Uh, it's like it's like having three different science suits in from Seven Wonders. Oh yeah, yeah, that's a good that's a good analogy. Yeah, it did remind me a lot of Seven Wonders actually, even though it's completely different gameplay. But specifically, the science. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, just that thing of you 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 pick a couple things to go for. You need enough resources to get all your buildings, but you you want to go hard in something. Well, I think those special cards are powerful enough. I think you could do a pure generalist strategy, and it might work. Well, that's kind of what I was the going initial... for, and it was okay, but it didn't really. The seem initial like round, the you get that first card based on who has the most, and so you'd have a disadvantage going into that round. That. Uh, yeah, after the initial first age, yeah, whoever has the most in each the category, they get they get a special card as well. So if you were too generalist, then you would get none of those cards, and then eventually everyone else would get those. So there is a, a strategy to, to doing that. But yeah, I, I agree that I think a, a good combination of both is... I think you could go the generalist and then just pick the double your coins or the brothers cards that or it's like it's a, it's its own collection set collection thing. Yeah, and if you get all four, it's like 150 points, I think. Yeah, it ramps up hard. Yeah, that's what I was going to go I for. Played... But Ben beat me to it. He picked before me. Yeah, and I yeah obviously I I bought this game, so I really enjoyed it. It was my my um top pick from the show, and I played it again last week with just two players. Um, and it has an interesting different mechanism. So. In the game, they put you as many cards as there are players are put out, and then you know if you're the last player, you get the last choice. But in a two-player game, you put out three cards, and then you have to pick between the three card options, and then one card will get discarded at the end. So that that was just a slightly different mechanism that I thought was interesting for for two players that I liked a lot compared to how it's played with more people. So but well still, just two. as fun. Worked really well. They have you eliminate some cards from the game as well. Um, but yeah, it worked really well with two and I love this game and plan on playing it a lot. Yeah. I very much enjoyed it. I suspect there will be a review review fairly soon as Lindsay brings it over to game night a few times and we play it more. Yes. I, I definitely want yes. to play it again. It's hard for me not to compare it to Furnace because they are somewhat similar in terms like you're auctioning for cards and then you're Furnace, you're running an engine and Nidavli is more set collection focused, but I feel like there was just slightly more interesting tensions in Nidavellir. There's also a lot of options and a lot of routes and a lot of different choices that you there's, could yeah. make in different selections and strategies. So there's a lot of replayability. Can you tell that I like this game? Um, a lot of replayability to it. So yeah, I just really liked all of the different options that you can you can take to switch, to switch things up. Mm-hmm. It has that classic thing in this sort of game where you want to do something that no one else is doing. 
Yes, absolutely. You got to find your lane for sure. Although now that I think about it, going back to this generalist versus specialist thing, the more you become a generalist, it actually like passively hurts all the other specialties, mm-hmm. right? Because there's a big difference. Like if you take four purple cards, whereas otherwise you would have taken like one purple card, that's denying like 30, 40 points to whoever's going hard on yeah, purple. Yeah, because right? the, the top couple purples really pay off. Yeah. You know, each one is like a 20, then 25, then 30 towards the end of the track. So Yeah, so like... Does this it's, game it'd be kind of five? like a denial played thing. with five, right? Yeah, it goes to so five. I suspect if you played with five and two people be, were generalists, like hardcore generalists, the game might kind that of would ruin everything else. Two people. Yeah. But of course, then they kind of cancel out because some of the bonus cards you get reward specialty strategies. So I think it I think there's a really cool dynamic there. But maybe at least at least like in a four or five player game, I think there's an incentive for one person to be a generalist. Now that I think about it, because you kind of sense. passively harm everyone else and you maybe get exclusive access to like that one set that's only available that way. And if someone doesn't block you, which, you know, any other given one, that's the seven wonder science thing is like, who's going to bite the bullet and try to block you on that instead of helping their own specialty. Now, I think I think there's something there. I, I, I want to play around with this one a lot. I think it's it's really cool. I also think it looks really intimidating when you first open it. When I was teaching the person that I was playing with last week about it, um, all of the different hero cards look like a lot to have to remember. But I think it's what the graphics are well done and it becomes really intuitive that as soon as you play it, you pick up on what everything means, which I think there's something to be said for that with a game where there's, you know, virtually 20 different different cards that all mean different things, but you can kind of easily sense what they're accomplishing it's, what they're trying to it's do. an intimidating first teach but it's Agreed. once you play it once or even once you play a couple rounds you understand how it works so yeah much again like seven wonders <laughs> lots of icons <laughs> <laughs> but that, yeah the yeah. iconography is done pretty well next second favorite collective game actually this one was tied with knit of Lear. this one was wise. the best this was my number one by a hair i mean i think the top four are pretty equal for me but this is the one i rank number one qe a game about inflation so it does get bonus points for being an economic economist nerd game uh (laughs) about quantitative easing uh and this is uh from what i understand although i haven't played the original game is a variation on reiner knizia's high society because it has this the fundamental mechanism that whoever spent the most money, and this is a pure auction game, whoever spent the most money total at the end of the game loses. So you cannot win the game. However, in QE, it takes the brilliant step of making it so that you can literally bid anything you want. Brilliant. You get a blank check, a whiteboard, you know, material blank, dry erase material blank check and you can write in any positive whole integer or zero that you want so of course naturally amber starts off and puts the first bid at what five million ten million ten million it was a conservative ten million it was it wasn't it like the entirety of china's real estate market or something like that yeah. 10 million was a tiny number. Come on. I was going to, if I, <laughs> my thought, if I had gotten first player, because whoever is in charge of the auction reveals what their bid is first publicly, and then everyone else bids as a reaction to that. So you kind of set the price. I was going to put in like four. <laughs> Just have four be the first bid or something but and see not, how far it went. But it's not thematic. <laughs> I don't know. I thought it'd be funny though. <laughs> But of course, you start at ten million. We ended up at what in the single multiple trillions, <laughs> single digit trillions. Yeah, yeah. It, it's a really interesting ramping thing because you never want to get too far out of bounds, and whoever's whoever's currently spent the most is incentivized to make the numbers bigger so that someone else has yes. to spend more than them. Yeah, which that that's really cool. That well, is really cool. it's the really interesting is a really cool dynamic in that. Whoever is 
winning and losing wants the numbers to go up. But the people in the person in second place definitely wants to bury the person in first place. And then maybe the person in third place is close enough to fight it out with second place and also wants to bury the person in first place. But there was never a situation where we could agree on a collective decision to just cause someone to lose the game, which is what you think would happen. You just choose someone and be like, you've lost. We're not going to bid amounts that make you relevant to the game again. And so if you want to keep getting points, fine, but you're going to lose. But there was never, and I tried to make it happen because I was sitting in second place for a good chunk of the middle. And I tried to make that happen. I was like, okay, let's just bury Amber or, or Orion. Amber and Orion kept ramping the numbers more than I mean, anyone else. We we were we had all the stuff. We bought the stuff early. So both of us wanted those numbers to go as high as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Such cool but, but the thing is, because there were five players, Ben and Lindsay were always behind and always had to keep bidding higher on the next thing up for auction mm-hmm. to try to get back in the running. And so Amber and I were able to play off of each other and keep bumping up the top numbers. Mm-hmm. And then Lindsay, <laughs> Lindsay <laughs> ate the final super high bid <laughs> and died. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it was at, at that point. It was, I think, yeah, I was, I, I was doomed. I think at mm-hmm. that at that point. Um, but yeah, I did. I did really, and I also just think it's a lot of fun, right? Just being able to bid like one trillion dollars, you know, whatever trivial number that you feel. I think the whole, you know, guessing aspect and just creating a funny number for whatever reason is really interesting. Yeah, a problem that I would like that I would like to have is to be able to bid a trillion of my own dollars on something. So <laughs> that well, that was a great problem. Ends up, I mean, it ends up being really thematic. Well, not, it's not super thematic because it's not like you know the that the economics of it. It's not like countries are bidding like quantitative easing isn't like a competitive bidding game. It's about mm-hmm. I won't get into what it's about, but the idea that the thing you were concerned about two turns ago is now literally irrelevant by the power of exponential growth is very thematic. Yeah, <laughs> that's a very government thing where you it's uh it's the um it's like an economics version of the oh I always forget the name of this term it's like the acceptability curve the Overton window. Oh, the Overton window. I right. thought I, I I thought of that in other terms of like what is the acceptable thing topics of discussion within people across a very wide range of opinions. But yes, but you see all of a sudden, but it applies to economic policy, right? So like the idea of spending, I forget how much, like a trillion dollars to give to banks all of a sudden seems really acceptable in 2009 where if you asked any lawmaker in 2007 if that would ever be acceptable they would say no and then you have a situation where it seems like dire and desperate and so now you have to give all that money to banks and the and idea, also everyone else some, is doing it's it it's a variation on robert higgs crisis in leviathan which is this idea that the government government power acts as a ratchet effect to where you have a crisis and the government uses that crisis in order to justify more power but post crisis it never ratchets back to its pre crisis levels of power it just maintains mm-hmm. that power that it has and then when the next crisis comes around it ratchets again forward which is an immensely important like political theory argument that came out in the 80s or 90s i think uh, but yeah, Robert Higgs, who I almost got to meet once, I did a very short internship. No, did I do an internship there? No, I just went to a couple of seminars at the place where he, at, at a think tank he works with. Yeah, it's kind of that thing in game form, which is really, really interesting. And fun. Super fun. Yeah. I, the QE is really fun. When you're playing, you're like, there has to be some part of this game that breaks, like that just kills the game. And I'm one who rants against this phrase of a game breaking, but it feels like that game ought to break, like no. legitimately break. But then you play and you start. It, it just about doesn't. And it doesn't. <laughs> it's all just collective decision making, and which is so brilliant. It's like mm-hmm. it's it's like it's walking a tightrope. What a cool game! Mm-hmm. All right, our number one game, not as exciting necessarily as QE, not as thrilling moment to moment, 
but of an incredibly well done game that's compelling throughout is Smartphone Inc. Also from a couple years ago, maybe 2018, 2017. Again, really cool visuals, that nice clean aesthetic. And it is reminiscent. The two games that I kept thinking about while playing it were Power Grid and Food Chain Magnate. I believe I described I, it. I agree on the Food Chain Magnate. I don't know if I see the Power Grid as much. I think Food Chain Magnate's the closer. I think I think I described it in the Discord channel as Baby's First Food Chain Magnate. <laughs> yeah, my in, first in Food Chain Magnate way. or something like that. Yeah. yeah, in a good way. It also, it a little bit felt like kind of the interlocking different systems that you'd get from a um, like a gallerist or those sorts of games, but you didn't have the multi-use cards. You just had these different systems and you were allocating resources and they affected what you could do in other systems of the game. Well, the fundamental thing that makes it similar to Food Chain Magnate is that it's about anticipating demand and filling it in a way that makes you distinct from the other players. So it's really like market competitiveness about catering to the demand as efficiently as possible in fundamental and, and also positioning yourself to get into markets that's that have the, that that's demand. where the power grid comes into play because there's this like geographic positioning thing where you're trying to snag your oh, into okay. different markets which i guess is in food chain magnate also but uh fundamentally it's about are you trying to sell a bunch of units cheaply by undercutting everyone else on price or do you go really high on price and then fill in the gaps that those cheap units can't fill but then doing that in a way that beats the other players who are also taking the same broad strategy which is which is really interesting again you kind of want to be doing the opposite of what everyone else is doing on a given turn yeah i definitely um, had a turn in this game where I did not anticipate anything. I think it was just the second turn of the game. And it was the it second was or third turn. turn. Totally you a wasted turn. I did units. Yeah. nothing. <laughs> yeah. Which sucked, but it was also good for learning the game, I think. I don't know. It, even though this game could feel mean at times, it also didn't feel mean. It it was almost like it's it's teaching good lessons in a good way. I don't know. It is much softer it felt, than Food Chain Magnate. Definitely, for sure. Yeah, it felt mean in the way that a competitive market is mean. But it was also, it was smoothed out some because you were all, you all started in your own region. So you were never competing with everyone until yeah. the last like two rounds. Yeah, it was also, it was pretty hard to actually collectively outsupply the demand. Until like the last round of the game where that definitely happened to, to some degree. I thought we all sold almost all of our cubes last did we? turn, didn't we? Yeah. I think just I Amber, we did. maybe. Oh, or did you not sell yours, Amber? Was. No, I did because I... Or no, you did? I only had a couple overflow and I had that card that let me sell them. So okay. I don't think I actually yeah, I'm not had sure. any left. I think everyone then maybe did. Yeah, I sold mine. Just barely, but yeah. I, I got all yeah. mine sold. The way actions are selected is weird. It's a little like spatial puzzle. So you have these two yeah. like cardboard tablets, like literally look like a, an iPad with apps, but the apps are your actions and you have to overlay them in creative ways so that to try to generate like the power of whatever given action you want, which worked. It was just, I don't know why you would ever come to that. Like, as a designer, I don't know what route you take in this game that leads you to that being the way you select actions. <laughs> well, it it was kind of thematic. The little cards, kind of smartphone-shaped, and they had the little squares, which are kind of app-shaped. I don't know. But I it's think not it... thematic at all. Like, it's just, it's yeah, it's using a smartphone representative device, but you don't use smartphones by laying two of them on top of each other and yeah. covering up your app symbols. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. You don't do that? That's the only way that I've been texting for the past, like, two years. <laughs> I'm not sure. Like, I don't... I have two phones. That's exactly how it works. It has you, yeah, you're not up to the hip. <laughs> the fold phones are back now, Mark. Have you not seen? Oh, are uh, people are starting to get those where the cell phones, like, fold on top of each oh, other. So this game is actually just really forward thinking. Even though it's still using 4g as its terms it's incredibly forward oh yeah forward one of the upgrades is way. 4g <laughs> yes 
which uh no, yeah, this really was a really fun game i love this yeah. game i gotta find like the design notes to see if like the whole action selection mechanism was just something they thought of independently of this theme and this idea and then they just slapped it on this game i have no idea how you get there as a designer like that's not into yeah because it doesn't need to be cell phone themed in any way like, there's nothing about the game and how it works that needs to be cell phone themed in any way it just like yeah. is the theme sure. but mm-hmm. um yeah i mean any yeah anytime where I, I i like anytime where like kind of the lowest scored person then becomes the first person so there's an incentive to have a low score to then to then be able to go first which is super powerful in this game and then, or I mean like that, thing. and then also like what you're actually, yes. And then what you're actually selling at determines what, like how, how soon you go in the game and all of that stuff is just super important. And then I also like the tech because I think sometimes you have a lot of optional decisions with games, but I don't think that the tech was an option in this situation. It was just a matter of what tech you ended up going with first and capitalizing on that. But yeah, I, I just, I really liked this game and would definitely play it again. Um, and I think they have a lot of potential for, upgrading the game as smartphones get more <laughs> yeah change they're gonna have to kind of keep updating this game accordingly so yeah it was very they smart, just make yeah. the next one 10g in hopes in hopes that that'll okay, we'll probably 10G. catch there by the time by the time that they reprint the game <laughs> 1 million g i think that's the next reiteration all right i'm gonna ask a stupid question the g in 4g or 5g that just stands for generation right I think so. I don't think it's like gigahertz. I don't think it's like this one's running on four gigahertz or whatever. I think it's just okay. a generation term. No, well, I'm, I'm, looking I'm pretty up. sure that they actually allocate generation parts of the bandwidth, the like the whole spectrum towards four G and five G, and four G and five G are just protocols on how it's allocated between devices or something. I, that's like that's probably very but wrong, but that's G the represent? idea. It's not like a bandwidth. It it just means the fifth generation of this technology. Yeah, right? I, th- I think yeah. so. Yeah, okay. yep. yeah. There but it's yep. it's just a series of protocols that help you efficiently use signals analysis, the data, cool stuff. Or it stands for Gates, as in Bill Gates. Conspiracy. <laughs> Are you going to start this yep. new conspiracy theory on Reddit or something? We have five, five Bill Gates. That's waves. what 5G is. Five Gates. Five Gates. Five Gates. Nanite tech. <laughs> that's Smartphone Inc. PaxCast. Yeah, PaxCast. That, that's the last game in our list. That was our number one game, collectively. Was yeah. so fun. I'm so who's good. who's buying it? That's my question. Yeah, I'll look into it for sure. No, I know. The top four here, I definitely. Well, no, top five. Just Crokinole. Top five, I would definitely like to own. Mm-hmm. I think we got one of them out of the way with Lindsay's purchase mm-hmm. of Nidavellir. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I definitely want to buy a QE though. It was my favorite. Yeah, sure. All right. There's our Pax cast. Pax was super fun. I learned that I could wear a mask for twelve hours straight. And I kind of forget about it most of the time, which is nice. I have been fortunate that that was the first time I've needed to wear a mask for like an extended period because I've been working from home almost exclusively. So there we go. Hopefully by next year, won't need to wear any masks at all. I would not take that bet. <laughs> all right. Thanks for listening, everybody. If you would like to see more from The Thoughtful Gamer, go to thethoughtfulgamer.com. If you'd like to support us, go to patreon.com slash thethoughtfulgamer. You can find me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And if you want to rate and review this podcast, that helps the algorithms. I think that's everything. I think I got it all in one. Yay. Thanks for listening, everybody. Goodbye.